Okay, I've come to realize that one of the most deepest and most fundamental needs of any person is the need to be accepted, at least, and ultimately to be loved. So I think we see that around us. And by saying I've come to realize, I guess I mean that I sort of knew it was true all along. You know, we, we sort of know that being loved is important. It's, it's the experience of my life though in seeing lengths others go to to be accepted that that really hit home to me I think and the problem is so many today uh, aren't getting that kind of acceptance and love that they really want and need many are brought up in broken homes uh, or at least one of the parents fails in their responsibility to love their child and of course by love I mean not just a simple fluffy uh, stuff only or you know just getting gifts given to you or whatever because there's a lot more that goes on a lot of that stuff going on is, is really a substitute it's it's a counterfeit true love just trying to you know buy you off kind of thing so so that raises the question what is biblical true love and i think one of the best answers is in john fifteen thirteen. so we, uh, i'll bring that up on the screen if you need that but um John 15:13 says, "Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends." Now, that's pretty extreme, isn't it? Lay down your life for your friends. But that's not what just what Jesus said, it's what he did, isn't it? He actually lived that out. So he died in our place. In fact, even while we were weren't his friends at that point, as Romans 5:8 says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's even more extreme. Now this is talking about dying for your friend up in, in John 15, but this is Jesus dying for his enemies. So we praise him for that. That's, that's love beyond love, I think, as far as, you know, as far as a humans can conceive of anyway. But as for us, assuming we don't have to actually die in someone's place, which most of us won't, God willing. So what does it mean for us to, to, uh, to, as, as an example of love, what is that example of love for us? How do we live that out ourselves? And I sort of think we can bring it down to the idea of sacrifice. So sacrificing yourself in some way, whether it be you know, comfort or money or time you know, or other resources that we have, it's for the long-term good of the other person. And that's really the essence of the kind of love that Jesus is describing here in in John 15:13. So, how do you love someone when you struggle to even like them? You know that situation? We commanded to love everyone, but some people we just doesn't work. Seemingly. Well, it's when you're willing to give of yourself to help them become more like Jesus. So that's if we look at love that way, it's a little bit different. It's nothing to do with, really, to, with helping them feel comfortable or happy, especially if they're loving their sin too much, causing damage in the church or whatever the case may be. No, it's not loving to be nice to someone who's destructive or living a destructive life. Uh, not in the sense of just making them feel comfortable in that. That's not what love is. Sometimes we need to love them enough to give them the hard word of truth about the situation. And that's exactly what Jesus did at times including in today's passage, as we just had it read. So he, he could see that pride and hypocrisy in those Pharisees and the, and the, and the teachers of the law there. And there was, there's also that Sabbath trap that the Pharisees set for him. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But there's also the, you know, the jockeying for good spots at the table uh, leading up to the meal. As far as Jesus was, was concerned, that put their pride and their short-sightedness on display so Jesus called it out so that's what we see in today's passage so now that was a very brave thing to do I don't know if you really thought about we sort of read these stories and realize if, if you're in that situation how brave that would be to actually take these guys on like that so can you imagine being invited to a meal with all the big shots in, in town and it, then you stand up and expose their hypocrisy and give them a public reprimand you probably wouldn't be that popular well you yeah. We know what happened to Jesus, so certainly he wasn't. But that's what he did here. He's very brave. And we can all learn from this, I believe. So let's, let's go to verse 1 of chapter 14, and we'll, we'll go through the story and pick a few things out of it. 
Luke 14 verse 1. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Okay, so this is now getting towards the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. So the Pharisees were well aware of his reputation and you know all the stories of his amazing works and teachings. Uh, which, which of course, as we said last week, was actually a threat to the religious power they had over the people because they, they didn't like it. So I'm sure they were watching him very carefully. In fact, the word watch there is, is a word which implies intense scrutiny. So you could say he was under the magnifying glass. That's why I chose the picture there because they're really keeping a close eye on him. So, and the evidence here was that this was a trap. Because as we read, read here, it was a Sabbath, so they knew it was a Sabbath, obviously. <laughs> if anyone knew it was, a, it was a Sabbath, it was the Pharisees. And it was a common practice to, for people to be invited over uh, to others' homes after a Sabbath service at the synagogue. And much like it often is in the Christian culture, you know, you invite others over for lunch after church or whatever, and, and uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing to do, and I think we should even do more of it than we do. But um, the point here is that the Sabbath... Invite created this opportunity for the Pharisees. And as we said, they hated Jesus. So they wanted to observe him from close range and see if they could find a crack in his holy man reputation. You know, he's getting all these, these stories they hear, so let's see if we can find him. He must have something wrong. So they want to set him up to hopefully fall. So verse 2, And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. So you've got audience, he always translates that word behold as behold. Um, but it's kind of like saying, surprise, surprise, guess who happened to be there? If you think of it that way, that's verse 2. Like there's a man who was visibly sick right there. Because dropsy, which is more commonly called edema today, for those who know medical stuff, I don't, but I had to look that up. Edema. It's a disease where you sort of have swelling in your, in your arms and legs and, and your face, even you can see it in your body, in all the tissues of your body really. So the point is it's pretty obvious if you have it uh, or if someone has it, so you can see it, they've got it. So it's pretty obvious that there's an unwell man right there before Jesus. And it's not surprising then that we have a setup here because we've seen them set traps for Jesus before, haven't we? As we've been going through Luke, we've seen various traps they've been trying to get him with a question or some situation. So the, the thinking would have been, you know, well... If he does nothing, we can attack him for not caring about the needs of the sick. But if he heals him, there, which we think is most likely, then he will have broken the Sabbath. At least according to their interpretation of Sabbath rules, he would have. And that's seriously deceived thinking, really, because you know, if this guy can heal people like that, whatever day of the week it is, and they can't heal him at all, Shouldn't they pay more attention to his claim to be the Son of God than, than the simple fact he was flouting their laws that they've sort of established anyway themselves, the, the strictness of their Sabbath laws? But the thing is they are far too deep into the false religion they had erected around the genuine law of Moses. So you know, there's the law that God gave and then there's all the other ones that they put around it and, and filled it out to make it far more difficult. But sure, the law of Moses said not to work on the Sabbath, that's true. But this was not the kind of work that God had in mind to prevent, is it? So Jesus was going to shine a light on that truth shortly. But let's just be aware here that Jesus can see right through the setup. Okay, So he sees, I've turned up, there's a sick guy right here. I see what's going on here. So he goes on the offensive, verses 3 to 4. Well, the first part of verse 4. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So Jesus is kind of saying like, Hey guys, come on, what's the story? You've clearly set me up, so I'm going to turn it back on you. Um, in fact, it's interesting here that the Bible talks about Jesus responding to the Pharisees. That's the word there. It's not the kind of word that would usually be used in that situation because it's normally used as, in a sense, of a reply to something, a question or, or whatever the situation might be. But uh, you may have noticed that no one has said anything about this as of yet, so no one else has spoken but Jesus. In fact, it's an interesting fact that this 
in this story, no words of anyone other than Jesus are recorded. So I guess guess the actions speak loudest, don't they? So yeah. So they anyway they had arranged the circumstances and were waiting to see what Jesus would do. So uh, as one commentator said, Jesus was replying to the opposition inherent in the situation because they'd set it up. So that's kind of the reply idea. That's why they've used the word there, I think. Why Luke used the word there. So it's interesting now that Jesus had asked the question of them and put the situation that they had designed for Jesus back on their own heads. If they said yes, they were breaking their own Sabbath rules. But if they said no, they were seen as heartless. So now it's the other way around. So when you're in a pickle like that, what do you say? Nothing. So that's what they did. And it's a long-standing truth that you know, silence implies consent. I hear in legal situations, is that right, Neil? Yeah, silence implies consent. So once Jesus saw their lack of response, he went ahead in his love for the man who was suffering. So in the rest of verse 4, then he took him and healed him and sent him away. Okay, so what would be going on in the Pharisees' minds right at this point? Jesus just healed on the Sabbath. That's what would be going on. He's a Sabbath breaker. He's a sinner. But what should have been going on in their brains? You know? Awesome, Jesus has just healed somebody. That's pretty amazing. That's a disease that we can't touch. We can't do anything. Jesus just healed it. Praise God. That's what should have been happening. Praise God. And some people in the Bible do respond like that, and we see that, but these guys didn't. Because, now, as far as them getting upset, did anything he do really resemble work in any way? Not not from what how the Bible describes it anyway. No, he just took him. Presumably that means he just, you know, some kind of physical contact and said, you know, or didn't really say anything, did he? Just that's it doesn't say what he said so he just touched him and healed him Um, so that was that in in itself was interesting I think there's no hocus pocus no fancy words or showy theatrics or whatever because he's God he can do it and he just does it he just healed him doesn't matter how really and at other times he healed in different ways so sometimes you know put mud on his eyes or sometimes told him to dip seven times, whatever. There's lots of different th- things he did, but it really just goes to show there's no formula. There's no magic that if you do things a certain way, you'll get God to obey your command or anything like that. So it's simply that Jesus has the power and authority and he uses it. So for me, it would I would use that as a warning that these people who, if you go on a limb here, people who have a big healing event and all flashing lights and pumping music and lots of razzmatazz, which result in healings that are questionable at best, outright false at worst, we probably shouldn't put much faith in them. And then I'd just like to demonstrate this kind of thing with a two-minute clip now from Johnny Erickson. Most people have heard of Johnny Erickson. She's a, a quadriplegic from 40 years ago, I think. She's been a very long time. She's, yeah, she's a great faithful lady. She's been through a lot. Um, but this is her experience. We flipped on the bedside television and... There was an advertisement. Catherine Coleman was coming to Washington, D.C. How many of you here remember her? Catherine Coleman, yeah. Well, for those of you who might not, she was like um, her Benny Hinn of the day, okay? Well, my sister and I got into the station wagon, and we got to the Washington Hilton Ballroom early. We wanted to have a good seat. We were escorted, however, over to the wheelchair section where I was sitting with a number of people, crank cutches, canes, walkers, wheelchairs. We all waited in anticipation. The lights dimmed, a spotlight came on the stage, and there comes Miss Coleman, sweeping out onto the stage in her long white gown. And with a crescendo of organ music, there are songs and hymns, and and before you know it, after some time, the spotlight moves to the far corner of the ballroom. And we can tell something's going on over there, like people are getting healed, are they getting healed? Are they getting healed? And so we're just waiting for the spotlight to come on the wheelchair section. Like, hey, come over here where all the hard cases are. (laughs) 
Before the service ended, ushers came to escort us all out of the wheelchair section and to the elevator so as to not clog the hallways. And I could hear the organ music on the other side of the wall still playing as I sat, number 15 in a line of 35 disabled people at the elevator. We were all very quiet. And I looked up and down that line and I thought to myself, something is wrong with this picture. Okay. So you gotta be, you know, be careful with individual stories. Everyone's story has their own angle on it, but I mean, that's, there's many stories like that. And I guess there'd be 34 from that night, <laughs> at least, 34 others. Um, but notice she mentioned Benny Hinn there. So I've got it, that's Catherine Kuhlman on the left. So you can imagine sweeping out in that white gown as she's described it. And then Benny Hinn she mentioned. So now I'll just be honest, I'm more convinced than ever that Benny Hinn is a fraud, having heard a fair bit from his nephew, Costi Hinn, not personally, but I've read his books and seen some of his uh, interviews. So he used to travel with the whole Benny Hinn show, but he became truly saved and now exposes the falsehood behind his uncle and others like him. Can you imagine the family get-togethers now? They're a bit tense. And um, if you want to find out more about um, Costi Hinn's story, I have a book I can loan you if you'd like. It's, um, it's excellent. But yeah, Benny's tactics pretty much closely describe what Johnny experienced just there in like setting up supposed healings for show and avoiding the genuine hard cases and, and that kind of thing. So that's my point behind this is that's not how Jesus did it. It's not how the apostles did it either or anyone else in the Bible who did healings. They healed people completely and genuinely right there. So the power is in God and in others at the times he chooses to use them. God chooses to use them. Because notice here that there is no indication in back in our passage that uh, that the man Jesus healed had any merit at all. He didn't say anything. There's nothing about his faith. And he did nothing to even hint that he expected to be healed. He was just there. So Jesus did this out of his grace, entirely at his own will. So it's not something that's on tap for anyone who claims the power, even if they claim it in the name of Jesus Christ. It can, it can still be done falsely. I'm not saying there's no healings. I'm just saying there's a lot of false ones out there. Anyway, back on topic now, back on our passage again. So we have the Pharisees probably mumbling, muttering under their breath, no doubt with some satisfaction that they, you know, Jesus had fallen into their trap. Uh, now they had more evidence to, to, in their bid to get rid of him. Awesome, cool, we're going to get rid of him now. So this was absolute proof, in, in their mind at least, that they were right and Jesus was wrong. And it's ultimately why they were doing these deceptive things. It came out of that desire for acceptance and value. And you probably haven't thought about that angle on the Pharisees, but I just want to sort of bring that out today. So it comes out of their desire for acceptance, to be you know, um, needed. It actually comes out of fear as well, fearing to let God take control and fear of missing out on love and missing out on that, that uh, acceptance they want. And when you get to their hearts, they're really the same as everyone. We need to belong. We need to have significance, all of us. And the good news is that in Christ, in the body called the church and as sons and daughters of the Most High God, we all have those things in spades. We have significance. We are children of God. We don't need to earn it. We don't need to try and prove it. But if you reject Jesus, as the scribes and Pharisees did, you're left to kind of scramble for acceptance and, and worth in the things of this world. That's, that's all that's left. So here we see them doing exactly that. So they say without realizing it, you know, if we can put this Jesus character down, we'll maintain our position and significance and people will come to us seeking advice and we'll feel important and loved. Okay, you can sort of see how, that's kind of the thinking behind what's they're trying to do by putting Jesus down. But in the end, this is all false. That kind of thinking is false. It amounts to nothing. Because if our value comes from what people think of us, what is there left when we're before God on Judgment Day and there's no one else? Our value has to be in Him. 
So our value has to come from our position as a child of God and a brother or sister of our Saviour Jesus. Then it's a whole different story when we're before God. Because we are inherently valuable since we are loved and redeemed by God. So as I often say, it's important to have an eternal view as we go through life on earth. So think about what's going to happen afterwards. We've got to live with that thought in our minds. The Pharisees did not, so they were left to fight over the scraps of significance that the world tossed them. And this was one opportunity they saw, to put Jesus down and lift themselves up. But the reality was, it was an opportunity for Jesus, not them, if you look at what actually happens. So it's an opportunity for Jesus to show them their hypocrisy and therefore give them a chance to repent. I guess that's what's behind Jesus' heart here, trying to show them what's going on. Verses four, uh, so 5 and 6 in chapter 14. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now I know it doesn't say donkey there, but I chose this picture to highlight the fact that there are some ancient manuscripts that do say donkey instead of son there, but I thought it was a kind of a cute picture anyway. So it's funny. But it doesn't really change the point whether it's donkey or son. Uh, And notice that they're still speechless. That's the other thing. Because Jesus had just put them in a checkmate situation. Obviously, they would pull out their animal as soon as it was possible if it was stuck somewhere on the Sabbath. But they may not have thought about that argument from the lesser to the greater that Jesus is making here. So, So that was Jesus' point. If you are allowed to express care and compassion for your animal on the Sabbath day when they're in trouble, how much more should it be right to express care and compassion for people who are made in God's image, the highest of God's creations, and on on the Sabbath day or whatever day, but on the Sabbath as well, especially the Sabbath even. In fact, isn't that one of the main points of the Sabbath anyway? To free that time to intentionally bless each other? So to set someone free of their illness is about the greatest blessing you can give someone. So it's very much in keeping with the Sabbath day to heal someone and, and how is it like I said how does it work really anyway it's not Jesus just touched him and that's it so what could the Pharisees say they clearly couldn't concede any gratitude to Jesus that would go against the grain and undermine them but he had shown that they were hypocrites too so on the Sabbath issue so they were snookered so again they said nothing Now I bet they were seething underneath. So Jesus was threatening their worth again in the eyes of their guests. So that was their biggest worry, even if they didn't realise it, that they were going to lose that that cred they had amongst the people. But still Jesus wasn't done. So he got them speechless, so he used that vacant airtime, you could say, to further his point, verses 7 and 8. Now he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noticed how they chose places of honour, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honour, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. Okay, now we we kind of have that today. I I know it's at my house growing up, Dad always had his seat at the head of the table, and that was Dad's spot. And uh, it's a bit different in our house, house, although I have my preferred spot, yes, but it's not at the head, it's at the side. But... um, it's really when you get into the more diplomatic situations where this really becomes a bit of a deal in, in modern times. So I've got a picture there of this week's talks between the US and China. So you can see Trump and Xi Jinping. Uh, you may not see him very well, but Trump's on the left in the middle there and Xi Jinping's on the right in the middle. But notice, it's a very... They have to be facing each other, obviously, because they're the head honchos. Then you've got the, the most important guy on the right of them and then to the right of him and then the left of him. And then it all there's a little diplomatic thing they do to work out all the seating so it does matter where you sit so in a similar way in Jesus day there were seats where the important people sat and seats where the lower classes sat and and when I say seats there weren't actually chairs Uh, so what we really mean in this context is that there were like there were places because people you know they would recline on their side with their on their left elbow so they're because most people are right-handed they would use the right hand to get the food and and everyone would sort of line up like that around the table. 
So it was more about regions of importance, I suppose, around the table. So as people arrived, they would obviously angle for the better areas uh, with, with more of the, sit with the heavy hitters so they could look more important and be privy to some of that, you know, important gossip that goes on at all these dinner parties. Which has got me wondering, uh, I wonder what kind of place Jesus had when this happened. I can't get an answer to that, but it's interesting. I wonder where he would have been sitting when this all happened. Uh, so it is an interesting question, but he, he, he may have had to call across everyone, you know, to, <laughs> to talk to these rich guys. I don't know, to the important ones, but, but we don't know. At any rate, Jesus saw that posturing and striving that went on as people found their places, so he, he tries to teach them a lesson by truly, on how to truly gain honour and acceptance and respect in other people's eyes. And that's in being lifted up from a lower place to a higher place. That's how it happens. So if you elbow your way to a higher place by yourself, you're leaving yourself open to being embarrassed. So if, as Jesus says here, you are in a higher place, but someone who ranks higher than you comes in, then here's what will happen, verse 9. And he who invited you will both, uh, invited you both, will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with, some, with shame to take the lowest place. So that presumably means but by the time you get booted out of your spot, there's only the low places left, so that's all you've got. You've just got to go down there. And can you imagine how you'd feel in that situation. It's bad enough for us, but in that culture, it would have been super humiliating. So up, out you get, go down there. So I think the lesson can be summed up by a verse in Romans 12, verse 3. I'll just bring it up for you there. I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than he... Oh, sorry, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So that's Paul's advice. So really the advice there is just to be honest about who you really are before God and before men. So just get a realistic idea. And when you think you have a right estimation, make allowances for your pride and round down. Just using a math term there. <laughs> okay, just because pride's such a sneaky thing, it distorts everything. So, whatever we think, just probably take it down a notch, and then you probably might be closer to where you really are. So, the temptation is to seek our own glory and make ourselves feel good and feel important and loved by inflating our own worth and abilities. And I was trying to think of a modern example of this age old problem, and then the example became obvious. Facebook, or whatever social media platform you, know, you want to look at, but we'll use Facebook because it's probably the most common amongst us here. So have you heard of face bragging or Facebook bragging? No? Well, I'll tell you a bit, bit more about it. Um, some people are extremely talented at, at dressing up a prideful statement as a humble one. So you might see something like this, and these are just generic ones I've got off the internet. Salesman of the year for the third time running. Never saw this coming. Hashtag humbled. <laughs> yep. Uh, Jenny got the citizenship award for her class. Again. Now, that's my girl. Hashtag God is good. There you go. Make it sound Christian so it's, so it's, it's all right then. Uh, a former Liberal MP, J Julie Bishop, she was accused of some face bragging a little while ago. This was, this is on her Instagram when she was foreign minister. Working with hashtag Amal Clooney, raising awareness of hashtag Yazidi plight, hashtag UNGA, hashtag bring Dais to justice. So it's cool to use hashtags, so you've got to use all those. But no, so she's just hanging out with Amal Clooney. That's George Clooney's wife. So, um, so just you know, rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous. So she sort of, so people accused her of face, face bragging and bragging about what she's doing, all those kind of things. So, Now, of course, it's easy to point fingers and judge. And that's the other side of the internet, isn't it? People who see themselves as the moral cyber police, there's plenty of those, and uh, they make it their business to call people out on things, like face bragging. But for both sides, the ones who do it and the ones who accuse them of it, for what we're seeing in this passage, the issue is, is this all about filling some hole in your life? Is it to get street cred 
or gain acceptance or make yourself feel good at the expense of others. So both sides, is, you could, you know, is there some of that there possibly? Because if it is, ultimately that is pride. And pride is deadly. So as it says there, the center of sin and pride is I. Something to think about. And unfortunately we are in an era where it's never been easier to get our ego stroked. And I hope I don't tread on too many toes here, but just um, if you, you know, put out a vague post on Facebook about how you're feeling bad, I need a hug, sad, sad face, and watch the do-gooders rush to your aid. Um, it's an easy way to get it, but what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it is it doesn't actually help. In fact, it makes you worse in the end because internet comments are cheap. They're like a drug, really. And once you're on that treadmill, you need more and more comments to pep you back up. So what's the, actually the best way to feel better if you need someone's encouragement? It's to get on the phone. Or better still, go and visit a good friend. That's what builds memories, actual personal contact. I do count the phone there because you know, conversation is, is one-on-one still. So there's, there's nothing like actual human interaction with someone to, to lift you up or at least stop you from dropping further. That's, that can help as well. So, And of course, the ultimate is actually prayer, isn't it? So spending time with God himself. There's nothing higher than that. So if you sit with an open Bible and a quiet heart and let God speak, that can lift you higher than anything. If you, if you want to let him. So these things help us get perspective too. You know, It's often not as bad as we think it is because you get down on yourself so easy. I know we all, we all do that. But get someone outside to give you a perspective about where you're really at and you realise actually it's, it's all right. Tomorrow's a new day. <laughs> so there are a few tips anyway. Um, and by the way, I'm not saying all status updates are bragging. Just, you know, just... What I'm trying to say is take a moment, check your true motives when you do that kind of thing. Now what about Jesus' tips for those who are trying to gain honour in the sight of others at this meal? Well, here it is from the lips of God himself through Jesus, verse 10. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all who sit at table with you. So you, know, you might not not get to move up. Sorry, so the end. So you might not get to move up. In which case, what have you lost? You haven't really lost anything. But if you take a lower place, you can say the only way is up. That reminds me of a song that's probably b- before a lot of people's time. <laughs> Actually, no, it's after a lot of people's time. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a nothing song that no one remembers. The only way is up. Yeah, in the plastic population. Anyway, don't worry. <laughs> 1989 or something, 88. Showing my age. Uh, now I've lost my place, thanks. <laughs> but yeah, so if, if you move from economy to business class, that's much better than being shipped back the other way, isn't it? Yeah. And this principle applies in many areas. So it's like when you're telling a story... Resist the temptation to embellish it and make it more impressive. That's one way this applies, I suppose. Like the old fisherman's brag. Was this big? If it's really worth telling, you shouldn't need to exaggerate it, should you? It should be worthwhile as as it is. And if you instead underestimate something you did, uh, then if people find out that you actually did more than you claim, that gains way more respect than if you exaggerate and get found out. Right, so you understand what I'm trying to say there. So, just be honest about it, or even underestimate it. Then, when people find out the truth, they go, "Oh, yeah, he was actually not trying to claim more." So, it gets you respect. So, yeah, overestimating loses respect. Underestimating gains respect. And gaining people's respect is one of the wisest things you can do in life. It's not in a bad scheming kind of way, but it's just very smart because it smooths relationships. It builds trust. You know, it demonstrates some leadership ability in some ways too. In fact, if you go into my office behind me, you'll see a list of themes for the year, every, back, every year back to 2011. So I sort of start the year out with a theme verse or a, just a word or a, few, a phrase. And my theme this year is seek respect, not affection. 
In other words, if people respect you, it's much better than them just thinking you're cool or nice or something without as much substance. So sure, it's nice for people to like you. That's great. Nothing wrong with that. But it's powerful if people respect you. So seek to gain and keep their respect. And you do that, generally speaking, by being reliable and humbling yourself. Not false humility, but genuinely seek or seeing yourself as God sees you as best we can. We can't get God's perspective directly, but we understand who we are. So how does God see us? Well, we're someone who was a sinner by nature, but have been rescued by grace and brought into the family of God. This is obviously saved people. That's who we are. We're in God's family. We're his children. And the thankfulness to God for that should flow into all our other dealings. So in in humility, in generosity, in all kinds of ways that honour God and who who loved us and brought and bought us. So this is how we should live. But notice it's not about trying harder to be humble. That that never works. It's from a true understanding of who we are in Christ. That's why true humility comes from a deep and committed relationship to Jesus Christ based on the truth in his word, the Bible, and that's where godliness grows. And we will find that we'll less and less care about the applause of the world. Who cares? It's, it's all passing away. So don't seek it. It's like Jesus says at the end of the passage, and we'll, we'll obviously close with this. Verse 11 there is similar to the line in the previous chapter in 13 verse 30. That, and that line was, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. So this is the chapter 14 version of that idea, but it applies it to our own desires. So this is Jesus' closing advice, verse uh, 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So As I've said before quite a while ago, you've got to go down to go up. That's the way God designed life to be. Jesus had to die before he was resurrected and exalted. An athlete has to be disciplined and trained and and hurt and pain and (laughs) everything to be able to get the glory of winning a race. And a grain of wheat has to fall into the ground and die if there's going to be a harvest. So all those going down to go up. So we need to follow that pattern too. If we're truly humble, we will in the end be exalted. So that's the, the message of today's passage. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you were the perfect example of of humility of sacrificing yourself for the good of others and going down to go up and Lord you take the highest place we thank you Lord we glorify you and we would love to be able to in some way represent you to other people in 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 that humility please Lord for those who need to have more humility break us show us um, who we really are and Lord we want We would love uh, to honour you um, as you work through us in that way. So we thank you for showing us this in Jesus' name. Amen.